to operational security has been given by the founder of Kensho Labs, Mr. Zachary Adam Nibui. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Zach Adam Nibui, and as he said, I work for Kensho Labs, which is going to sound a lot less impressive in a second when I actually introduce myself. Um, Kensho Labs is my night job. We do secure development mostly, build uh, data integrity tools. The rest of the time I work for Skillsoft, just around the corner, uh, doing tech support for them. Uh, and I am easily the least qualified speaker at uh, B-Sides this year. I have no formal certifications and I shouldn't need any. Uh, what I'm going to say today is mostly common sense. If it's not common sense, I encourage you to maybe argue with me during the Q&A at the end. Maybe I'll learn something in the um, That dovetails nicely into your standard boilerplate disclaimers. So it's almost obligatory these days. You have to say that you know my employer didn't approve this talk and here under my own sort of recognizance. The other thing I really want to stress is that I'm neither a lawyer nor an accountant. I've studied law and I've studied you know, finance. But I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an accountant. I'm definitely not your lawyer or your accountant. So some of what I talk about is going to sound a little bit like maybe it's legal advice or financial advice. I would strongly encourage you to talk it over with an actual lawyer or an actual accountant. Um, operational security is kind of a weird term. Uh, a lot of people, when they think of operational security, they think of... Um, Operational security the way criminals or spies would think of it. You think of Jason Bourne with a safe full of fake passports and six different countries' currency. But for most people, that's overkill. That's actually ridiculous to, to use that much secrecy and deniability in your operations. Um, for a lot of other people, it's also an excuse if you're going to a security conference, maybe not B-sides, but if you're going to one of the bigger security conferences, people tell you, don't bring your real phone, don't bring your real laptop, bring a burner device that you can discard. That's also ridiculous. A way better definition of operational security, circular though it may be, is operational security is what you do to keep your operations secure. It's what you do to make sure that your business is going to work tomorrow the same way it worked today, the same way it worked yesterday, and so on in both directions. The reason secrecy doesn't work for most businesses is because most businesses aren't criminal. So if you're that guy, you don't want anybody to know who you are because that serves your purpose. But if you're Palo Alto or you're me or you're Microsoft, you want a reputation for doing your job well and doing it right. You want the hype that comes when you say you're going to announce a new product soon or, or a new service soon. And if you're wasting all your time being too secretive, you can't build that reputation. Freelancers are even more different than actual business. So an actual business, if somebody uh, messes something up badly enough, you can fire that person. So if you are Bitify, and you came out and said you have this hardware wallet for Bitcoin that's unhackable, and you got John McAfee to back it, and uh, did that whole mess, and then you did a really bad job with your PR and made all the security researchers unhappy with you, you can fire that PR person and maybe you'll survive. But if you're me, you can't fire your PR guy, because you're your own PR guy. Uh, additionally, in the freelance world, your competition behaves a little bit more like criminals behave than actual businesses. Uh, big companies have these, these really scary things called lawyers, and lawyers like to so, uh, they're almost like the merch, uh, mutually assured destruction of business. If I have a big legal team, you have a big legal team, we're not going to cross each other the same way two people who don't have lawyers would because lawyers are expensive and getting into that legal battle over something is going to waste a lot of time and resources. The other side of that coin is in the freelance world, freelancers themselves and often their clients as well don't have a lot of formal business training, don't necessarily know what is and isn't an accepted practice or even is and isn't a legal practice. I know I got into freelance uh, security research because I like the security research part, not because I like the finance part. And that's true of a lot of people in freelance. Maybe you're a really good malware dev or malware reverse engineer or something. That's what you're trying to do. You didn't get in it just to do 
TPS reports and so forth. So now that you know why freelancers are special, the sort of zeroth step of any security model is to come up with the actual threats you're facing. Because if you don't know what you're defending against, you're going to maybe put way too much effort into something you do need to worry about, and not nearly enough effort into something you don't need to worry about. I think I said that <laughs> Um But there, there's really a very limited threat model for business. It's, it's, it, it sounds, all up in bullet form, it looks a little ridiculous, and, and some of them will even sound ridiculous when I say them out loud, like sabotage. You don't normally think of sabotage as being like a huge risk to your business, but it, it's there, particularly in the two special cases. So I'll talk about them in a, in a second, but patent trolls and uh, what I call the indemnity exploit are both a special kind of sabotage that can be a really big impact to your business. Um, the same with identity theft. Everybody in this room has to worry about identity theft. If you're alive and you have a social insurance number in this country, you have to worry about identity theft. Uh, but if you're in any kind of business, whether you're a freelancer or an actual business, you also have to worry about the identity of that business being stolen, which I'll cover. Um, Third, of course, you have your competitors. Your competitors would love you to go out of business. They would love to steal your IP, to get your client list, to get uh, really any useful information you have. Because they want to sell more or less the same thing to more or less the same people. So if they can avoid doing all the legwork, so much the better for them. Uh, last, oh, no, it's not lastly anymore, right? I added a category. Um, there's also scams to worry about. There are way too many scams that we could go into them in detail, but if you're in freelance, there's three you're going to run up against all the time, so I'm going to make sure to go over those in a second. And then lastly, I added this slide specifically for security people, um, angry criminals. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what I mean by that when I go through these in detail, but this is a very small risk, but if you think it's in your threat model, you need to start thinking about it right away because there's no do-overs in operational security. There's no starting again without completely burning your brand, but again, it's starting over. Um, so, sabotage, I, I, I mentioned uh, first, so I'll talk about it first. There's the obvious kind of sabotage, the, the kitchen nightmare sabotage, where somebody comes up and posts bad reviews on Yelp or Fiverr or Kijiji or wherever, saying you're terrible at your job. And there's no security avenue to that. The only real way to protect yourself against that is PR. There are security solutions to these two, though. Um, the first kind, the, the identity exploit, is kind of an interesting one because I fell for it myself, which in another setting where I was less nervous might make for a funny story. Um, but it, it would suffice here to just explain um, the exploit, which is essentially, in, the, in Canada, we have three varieties of law one which isn't relevant to the conversation, one that's civil law, which is speeding tickets and vandalism charges and that sort of thing, and then another which is criminal law, which is the kind of law where you break this law and you go to jail. So every freelancer who's been doing security work and maybe doing <coughs> penetration tests or network mapping or anything like that, you have in your standard agreement that you use at the beginning of each job an indemnity clause that protects you against liability. The problem is it only protects you against civil liability. So if you've end-mapped the client system and it goes down because it's terribly managed and they're out a bunch of money for the downtime, that would be on the client because of your indemnity clause. But if you committed a criminal act, you can't indemnify that. That, has, that, that stays with you. So what happened to me was I enlisted myself you know, doing this kind of work and I didn't vet my client enough and it turned out they didn't have authorization to test on the system that I was hired to test against. Which meant if I'd gone forward with the test and thankfully I didn't, I kind of caught myself short and, and pulled up. Um, if I had committed that, I would have been in violation of not even Canadian law, but American law and I would have gone to jail probably for a really long time because uh, the maximum penalties for CFAA violations are absurd. The good news is, just because you listened to that story, you're already halfway insulated against that particular threat. There are some more general solutions to the indemnity problem, which I'll talk about 
toward the end when I talk about solutions in general. But just knowing that there's a difference between civil and criminal liability, you're slightly more prepared to deal with that problem if it should arise. Uh, the other kind of sabotage is a patent troll. Uh, there are way funnier and more interesting talks about patent trolling specifically than I could possibly hope to cram into this particular one. Uh, but what a patent troll is going to do is he's going to come along, he's going to find some aspect of a process. Not necessarily your process, because you're not Microsoft and you don't make enough money to make only going after you worth his time. But he's going to find, say, the idea of a software manifest. And then he's going to say that any technology that uses this previously unpatented concept is in violation of his patent, like WinZip. So now he's going to sue everybody who's using WinZip. And usually they lose, but they only lose because they're fought. For a good long while before any patent troll case goes to trial, people are just settling out of court. There's defenses against that as well. With identity theft, you have you know, the, the classic kind. I steal your social insurance number, I get myself a mortgage, now I own a house. You don't own a house, you can't buy a house because it looks on paper like you already own one. And I can walk away from the mortgage without any real fear of repercussion because it's not my credit score. Um, everybody needs to worry about that kind of identity theft. But as a business, you're exposed to a second kind, which is somebody pretends to be Kensho Labs or the Foonly Studio or McAfee for whatever purpose. So the, the simplest version of the scam I've seen is somebody literally sets up pretending to be your brand or you personally, takes in a bunch of clients, walks away with the money, never does any of the work, and your reputation is just burned to the ground. You'll never work again at that point. Not in the same industry anyway. Um, there's no technological solution to either problem. Both of these problems are solved by Vigilance. So, in the in the case of your personal identity, you can protect that the way you know your parents have always told you to protect it. Don't post your street address on Facebook. Keep your your digital presence minimal. For a brand, really, all you can do is know your rights in terms of copyright and trademark and all the rest of it. What is legal and illegal isn't going to protect you, but what you can do legally to protect yourself is worth doing in case something does happen. Oh, that's way too dark to show up. It's a shame. That was the funniest slide in the whole video. Um, your competitors, like I said before, they want to steal your IP. That's everything, right? So that's client lists, the proprietary way came up with a replacement for NMAP that's illegal, or not illegal, immune to, say, honey ports, or your particular special way of doing things, having the client list, having your list of active bids. If somebody knew every bid that I put out and just went around to all the same contract requests and put in another bid for 10% less, I'd never work again. So your clients... You know, your competitors may or may not always be that aggressive. I would like to think that in the freelance world, we also sort of see each other as much as colleagues as competitors. But this is still something you have to be worried about because goodwill doesn't actually protect you against anything. You should still, whether you trust your, your competitors in your field or not, you should still take every active measure available to you to prevent that. And there's quite a few that you can take to protect your information. And I'm going to talk about them after we're done threat modeling. We also have con artists to worry about. We have scams. I know I mentioned that there are way too many to talk about in full detail, but there are three that sort of come up a lot in freelance. The first and kind of the biggest, because I, I feel like not enough people realize it's a thing yet, is the chargeback scam. So if you use a payment platform, like not to name names, but like PayPal or Stripe or whatever, you use a payment platform. Most of those platforms have a mechanism where the client in, in the transaction can file a chargeback. They can say that the work wasn't completed, there's no proof the work was completed, give me my money back. And the payment platform will very helpfully just go and take that directly from your account with them, and give it to the client, and then eventually come after you for the difference. The defense against that is weak in a lot of industries, but in security we have an unfair advantage that even though we're mostly providing a service, it's also really easy to prove 
we've done something. It's, it's really easy to create, say, an entry in a program that you wrote for somebody that requires them to come to you after the fact and get an activation key, which would prove they received the file, and their, their request for that activation key becomes your proof of work. Uh, we also have to worry about fake vendors, uh, not as much as maybe uh, full-size businesses do, but there's a risk anytime you do business with anybody that you're actually dealing business with you know, one of those brand theft people who just wants to rip you off and take the money and has no interest in giving you the shiny new switch or the new cloud service that you wanted or, or what have you. Um, and of course we have the ordinary people not paying you type scam, which it's barely worth mentioning because that's a risk in any business. But again, if you have something like a activation key requirement or other forms of copy protection on your work, you can at least make sure that they don't have full access to what they pay for until it's paid for. Last, of course, we have angry criminals. Um, this is, a, as I said before, a very, very small threat. There's only a few people, maybe, in the whole world that actually have to worry about bad men with guns. And it might not just be criminals, it might be any bad men with guns. But if you're in a certain subset of the security industry, if you're developing cryptocurrencies, payment systems, lottery systems, if you're involved in privacy technology in any way, if your favorite afternoon hobby is to shut down uh, command and control systems for ransomware, um, this, there is a risk you make Mr. Miska angry and have to answer to him. Um, there's really only two things to be said about angry criminals. The first is, if you really do feel like angry criminals are out to get you, you need a better weapon in your arsenal than anything I can give you. Uh, and the second thing to remember is the zeroth commandment, which is, you will not avoid the Mossad. He with the most money, who is the angriest, will win every time. So, very little, it's worth mentioning, I was asked to mention it, but very little can be done to protect against this threat, besides the same things you would do to protect against identity theft, which is, fundamentally, compartmentalization. Uh, so especially social compartmentalization, where you break everything up um, into little boxes. So somebody might know you as in you, the owner of the Foonly company, but they don't know you as in you, the son of this person and husband of that person, you know, best friends with this guy. Then you also have uh, sort of legal and financial compartmentalization, which some people refer to as cutouts, which has always bugged me because, again, that's spy novel terminology and we're allergic to that. And then, of course, technical compartmentalization will help as well. Uh, the other two big tools in our cabinet are our ability to verify things and prove things. And I couldn't think of a better term for it, but copy protection. The idea is that we can have control over a data asset. So, the first kind of compartmentalization that's worth talking about in detail is that idea of social compartmentalization. Um, we live in a, an era where everything we do is online, and especially if you're freelance, it's really easy to fall in the trap of working in public, for lack of a better term. You want a strong social media presence because in this industry, working for yourself, that's how you get work. So, you know, a lot of, there's two conflicting ideas when it comes to social compartmentalization. The first one is that your parents were right and you shouldn't ever use your, like, your real personality on the internet. And the second is that, you know, all the millennials are right and you can totally use your real personality on the internet as long as you do it in a sufficiently wise way. It, it's the idea, It's the idea of having different accounts for different purposes. So maybe I have a Z out of Mac account that you can find really easily on Twitter and Facebook and all the rest that's going to be kept really clean and personal and professional and, and it'll look really nice. But then maybe I also have another account under another name or a pseudonym and that's where I go to do all the things one does on the internet that might get you a bad reputation, like arguing with people online or, or what have you. Um, 
This is useful for a few different reasons. The first is that the harder it is to steal your identity, the harder it is to do anything. So if I have a professional account with my real name on it, but you can't use that to get my mailing address or any kind of banking information or anything like that, money. The other thing is if I've locked in all my political stuff to some pseudo-anonymous um, sub-account that only a few friends know, I get to avoid what I like to call the pogo problem. So there was this, uh, this freelance uh, musician named Pogo who used to go out and, and do a lot of work, but then he took some incredibly unpopular uh, political opinions and his career just kind of evaporated. Because if, it turns out if you make enough people angry, it doesn't matter what service you provide, they're just going to stop working with you. The same thing can happen in reverse. I've seen, especially recently, people taking unpopular political positions and working for Comcast or AT&T or whoever, and then the people who they annoy will go to Comcast, AT&T, or whoever, and demand that, you know, this person's head on a plate, please. And nine times out of ten, I've seen that the company will fold. So doing social compartmentalization makes sense, if only from a, from a protect-yourself perspective. But it, it's also useful... In, if you're in one of those sensitive fields and you feel that the bad men with guns are part of your threat model, maybe you make the professional account a handle as well. And it's all just layers and layers of handles in a reciprocating kind of cycle. Nobody, nobody who does compromise one account gets access to any of the others. But of course we have um, fiduciary compartmentalization, uh, which is you know, legal and financial compartmentalization, the idea that you should break things up into cutouts. Um, I promised my buddy that there would be a mention of fake IDs in this talk, and, and this is what I meant. If you have a few hundred dollars, if you have less than the value of this machine right here, you can go down to Service New Brunswick today and register as a numbered corporation. The numbered corporation is, a, corporations in general are this amazing financial liability tool. Um, because corporations are, for a lot of intents and purposes, they're people. So you can have bank accounts in the corporate name, you can have assets owned by the corporation itself, and then in the absolute worst case scenario, if something happens to one of those accounts, something happens to the corporation itself and it's compromised, and you have to walk away for one reason or another, all that liability goes with the company. Now, I'm not saying you should use that for nefarious purposes, people actually have, but in an absolute worst case scenario, if you can keep your business and your personal finances completely separated using you know, a tool like incorporation, then if you really do mess up and the money transfers that you're using to do business as Kensho Labs or the Foomly Studio or whoever, if something about that goes wrong, somebody gets the, those credentials and drains that account, at least you're only out the business's assets. You still have all your personal stuff locked up safely away from anything anyone can touch. Um, as I said, it, it's super cheap. I, I can't remember exactly how much it was, but it, it was well less than $1,000 the last time I did it. Um, Further, even if you're not going to incorporate, you should think about payment platforms. You should never, well, I mean, most of us in this industry invoice out enough that you probably aren't going to be dealing in cash, but use a payment platform. Use something like PayPal, uh, Stripe, what have you. It's useful for a couple of reasons. The first is the same policies that are letting your clients do chargebacks. Um, there are additional policies in there that are also protecting you and those policies let you essentially steal the reputation of PayPal or whichever platform you're using as being reliable. It, it adds a trustworthiness to you that randomly e-transferring money around might not. Alternatively, if you're particularly concerned with privacy or you are, for some reason, allergic to the idea of using PayPal, you could use cryptocurrencies. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend it, but it is an option. A lot of freelancers do get paid pretty much exclusively in crypto. It's something to think about, and if anonymity is one of your concerns, it's pretty much your only option. <laughs> Lastly, as far as compartmentalization goes, you do have technical compartments to consider. Um, <coughs> I know I mentioned it at the talk, but the idea of a burner device, a laptop that you only use for work, that's kind of overkill. 
uh, having a phone that you only use with one client and then you get rid of that SIM card and put in a new SIM card for the next client, that's absolutely ridiculous unless what you're doing is illegal. Uh, but there's still good arguments to be made for breaking things up into smaller boxes from a technical standpoint. So it maybe if you have, uh, for example, a presentation to give, maybe you spin up a presentation account on the laptop that only has access to the directory with the presentation in it and your software suite. And then if you leave your laptop lying around in the, the adventure hall, hopefully nobody can get up to too much nonsense in the five minutes you're out in the hallway. Um, there are more extreme examples of that. Some people use an OS called Cubes, which is not really... Explaining it would be just a little bit too much to go into, uh, but it, it essentially, for every application, there is a VM for every purpose. You could go that extreme. You could have it so that you have a VM with a browser in it that is how you do the banking for the business. That's possible. And then if the only thing that VM does is the banking, and that's the only way the banking is done, no amount of bad email coming in from clients or vendors or even just spam compromising your main system is going to make too much of a problem for the banking VM. I find, personally, the user privilege separation, the idea of having like a work account and a play account on the computer, I find that more useful, especially if you combine it with a minimum privilege uh, type model. So your work account that you use to generate um, slide decks or you know, uh, cobble together projects for, for for what you do for a living, might, not, might or might not need root, depending on what you're doing. Your goofing off account for the rest of the time when you're browsing YouTube and downloading videos, that does not need root for any reason. And having it have root or have local admin is just asking for trouble. Because if I have, you know, if I have my entire client list sitting on, the, on this computer in one user's directory, and I click the wrong email sent to me from my competitor, now my competitor has my entire client list. Assuming that you want to be that paranoid about your competitors. And then, of course, we have uh, authentication, uh, which is more of a Venn diagram than distinct categories, but it's the idea that you can either identify something or at least verify it. So uh, we want to know who we're talking to. I, I, even if that person is anonymous, if you're doing, like, say you do malware research for a living, even if everybody you're dealing with uses a handle, you at least want to make sure that you're dealing with the person who properly uses that handle. You don't want to be talking to some imposter or random person. There's a few ways to do that. PGP is the way everybody wants us to do it, but I think I might be the only person in the room who actually uses PGP for that purpose. So I find a better way to identify people is, is a little bit of OSINT. It's to get out there and shake the tree and, and see if their account actually looks like a legitimate account. Um, a better way to do authentication, especially for contracting, is to verify somebody. Even if I can't prove that you are um, John Random Hacker, I can at least prove that you have control over the system you're asking me. If I had asked the client in the, the story, the indemnity story, to place a file somewhere on the server that I could go get and get the hash from, that would have stopped the whole scam right there. You wouldn't have been able to do it, and I would have realized something was up. But of course we have uh, copy protection, uh, which is sort of a bad term for it, but it, it's data integrity. Uh, so that there's Two ways to go about data integrity. The first is to use your legal tools. With <coughs> the legal tools are useful. They are not absolute. If laws were perfect protection, none of us would need to be here, and this would be a conference about something else. But you should still be aware that you know copyright law, trademark law, patent law all exist and may be applicable to protect your things. Because if, if you've gone ahead and patented your entire process, not that it would necessarily be patentable, but if it was, nobody would be able to come in and patent troll you by pretending to patent some sub-factor of it. Additionally, copyright and trademark law are how you protect yourself against brand theft. The ability, if, if Kensho Labs is more than just a name, if it's a registered trademark, you can go after people who are misusing it. If it's just a name, your protection term is good. 
Uh, additionally, we have uh, locks or sort of hard copy protection. Um, secrecy of method is a valid one, although I personally have always felt that nothing remains secret nearly as long as you think it does. Uh, so if you have a secret method, maybe uh, not rely exclusively on that. Uh, actual copy protection obviously falls in the system. Um, so would encryption, both during communication and data at rest. Uh, I'm a proponent that everything should be encrypted all the time for any reason, uh, whether you're moving it or it's just sitting on a hard drive. And last, and probably most importantly for avoiding the chargeback scam, you need proof of work, proof of access. You need a way, whatever it is that you do for a living, whether it's penetration testing or software development or something sort of in the mix otherwise, you need a way to be able to prove, to the, both prove to the client and any interested third party that the work was actually done. You need, a, if all you're doing is delivering a report, maybe you need to log the server the report is downloaded from to make sure you can show that that file actually was accessed and the client actually did go get it, because otherwise you're leaving yourself open to somebody scamming you. And uh, unfortunately, I'm massively ahead of schedule if I'm already on the slide, but uh, lastly, there is the idea of uh, open source intelligence. So for every security, there is a insecurity. For every blue team, a red team, and an opsec, it's the people who do open source intelligence that are our red team. So if you, have, if you have OPSEC and you're really concerned that it's important, maybe you are scared about the uh, angry bad men with guns, or maybe you're just curious to see how well you're doing, hire an OSN contractor. Get them to, to give the tree a shake, go at your social media profiles, and see if they can find the secret stuff you don't want them to. Because if somebody you pay finds your social insurance number listed online somewhere, that's one problem or they figure out you know, your mother's maiden name so they can log into your bank. That's one problem. A guy who does it maliciously isn't going to tell you that you had that problem. Uh, conversely, it's also a useful tool for us. So within reason, as long as you stay within uh, sort of like legal and ethical boundaries, a little bit of open source intelligence can go a long way toward identifying or verifying a client. If somebody comes to contract you for a major job, but you can't find any trace of that person on the internet, maybe it's not worth your time to take that particular job, even if they do want to pay a deposit or what have you. And unfortunately, I know I'm considerably early, but that's actually the end of my deck. So thank you all for coming, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take <laughs> Yeah, um, so I have a very limited amount of, like I did a commerce degree 10 years ago, um, so a few classes in kind of the business protections, and the impression that I always had was that um, incorporating, I mean it provides some protection, but as kind of a single person behind a corporation, if someone really wants to get at your assets, there are ways, if they you know, wanted to lawyer up. So uh, what are the protections that you're talking about that, uh, say, starting a numbered corporation to um, act as a front for your business interests provides you? So you're actually absolutely correct. If somebody wanted a lawyer up, they could crack that particular liability shield as long as you can't lawyer up better than they could. Okay. Um, what, what incorporating does, and uh, with the caveat that it's been a while since I've done any business training myself, um, it, it, it's more sort of financial and civil liability protection. If somebody is wronged by your corporation, they're wronged by the corporation, which means they can go after the corporation's assets. And everything can be forfeit. Everything wrapped up in the business that the corporation owns can go away. Uh, the, the real classical example of this is, a, a say, a bar with a, with a nice patio on the street, and it freezes over the winter and somebody you know, slips and breaks their leg. If they sue the corporation that owns the bar and win, they get potentially everything that the, the corporation owns. But the gentleman or, or gentlewoman who owns the corporation might be able to walk away as long as, like, if, as long as it's not ridiculous. If you, if you create the corporation in a way that like all the assets are tied up as like one dollar, then 
a judge is going to look unfavorably on that. But if, if you're genuinely functioning as an employee of this numbered corporation, even if you're the only stakeholder. So you're the owner and, the empl and an employee. Which is legal. Okay. I've, I've checked. Um, as long as you're not collecting dividends and a salary simultaneously, there's little that can be done other than to take your ownership stake in the company. Okay. So, but if you did want to do that uh, as a form of protection, talking to a lawyer would be a really good idea. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, yeah, I sort of implied in, the, in that conversation that you could just walk down to, to Service New Brunswick and do it yourself, and that's correct in and of this, the sense that you can go down and register the number corporation today. You should absolutely talk to, at minimum, a lawyer and a chartered accountant before you actually do. <laughs> Actually, I own a cafe uh, online, <laughs> and I was corporate and everything. I still lost my house. Really? I'm surprised. Yeah, this was the kind of thing that I so, had heard could happen. So it just depends on what, what the, what, who, who's, <laughs> who's behind the, uh, who's going to sue you or yeah. get, try yeah. to get to you. And, and the mood of the judge on the day of. It's all how much you got in your pocket. <laughs> As with all security, it's not perfect assurance, for sure. Yeah? Uh, you were sort of a freelance organization. When, during the creation process of that, would you start? Like, would you start making your accounts before you even uh, bid on jobs so that that's already there and existing? I mean, ideally, uh, as with any, any form of OPSEC, you would start the security process before you start the operation. So. I would, like, I, I'm a bad example because I went into business and I'm trying to do this all retroactively. But yeah, ideally you would spin up these accounts. If you incorporate, you'd incorporate. You'd set everything up well before you take the first contract so that you don't end up accidentally handling business through a personal account and tying everything back together. Because once it's tied together, there's no one tying it. If that's everyone's questions, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks for coming.